Happy World Carnivorous Plant Day. My name is Blake and I'm a carnivorous plant grower from Minnesota. I mainly grow Nepenthes in an indoor grow tent setup and today I'm going to be talking to you about a tray watering method for Nepenthes that could help simplify your watering routine and I'll also be doing a brief tutorial on how you can build your own setup. Many of you may already be familiar with the tray watering method used for most other carnivorous plants like Saracenia, Venus flytraps, sundews, and any other water-loving plants. Nepenthes, on the other hand, have slightly different water requirements. Many want an evenly moist substrate, but don't want their roots completely sitting in water. The traditional or conventional method for watering Nepenthes typically involves top watering your plants every few days without letting your plants sit in water. This method is pretty time consuming and requires a lot of care and attention in order to keep up with the individual needs of each plant. Not to mention the difficulty of finding someone to care for your plants if you ever want to travel or have to be away from your plants for any extended period of time. Two years ago, I started using self-watering containers in an attempt to address the shortcomings of uh, conventional watering for Nepenthes. And for the last year, I've been growing my entire collection using several four foot wide self-watering trays. Self-watering containers and trays are not a new idea by any means, uh, but this method doesn't seem to be widely used for Nepenthes. There are some commercially available self-watering trays or self-watering containers out there. Um, however, these are usually no bigger than a standard 10-20 tray and only hold a small number of plants. So that is obviously a limitation when you're talking about um, you know, a collection of tens or maybe even perhaps a hundred plus carnivorous plants. So I'll demonstrate how I essentially scaled this up for Nepenthes growing on a larger scale. But first, I should briefly touch on what exactly I mean by self-watering and how it works. So self-watering uses capillary action to wick water from a reservoir into the substrate of a plant. Capillary action is defined as the movement of water within the spaces of a porous material, like the substrate, uh, due to the forces of adhesion, cohesion, and surface tension. You've probably experienced capillary action before if you've ever dipped a paper towel into water and watched as the water magically climbed up the paper towel. This is also how water is wicked from a reservoir and transferred into the media of a plant in a self-watering system. This is one of my smaller scale self-watering pots where I have my plant potted in here. This white pot serves as a water reservoir and there are these two um, fabric wicking cords that go from the water reservoir. You can see the water dripping off the cords there. Uh, capillary action pulls water from the reservoir and wicks it into the substrate of the pot, keeping the plant evenly watered. So now that we've discussed a bit about how this works, let's get into how to set up a tray. The first piece that I have here is the tray itself. This is a four foot wide by 20 inch deep tray that I got from a gardening supply center. I got a tray this large because the racks that I have in my grow tent are four foot wide shelves. So I wanted to maximize the shelf space that I had available to me for my self watering setup. Now, if we were just growing Saracenia or Venus flytraps, this is the only thing that we would need. But since we're growing Nepenthes and we don't want these plants to sit in water, we need a couple more pieces. We need a way to raise them up a couple of inches while still leaving room for a water reservoir below. That's where these platforms come into play. Now the way that these are designed, they stand just about an inch and a half tall, but they are open on the bottom, allowing water to move freely throughout the tray underneath. Now what I've done is I've taken multiple of these platforms and arranged them to cover the entire surface area of the tray. I source these platforms from a gardening supply company, but part of the fun of DIY is just figuring out what materials you can use to accomplish the same thing. I'm sure something similar could be accomplished using uh, egg crate diffuser or other similar materials that are commonly used for other DIY construction projects like this. Now that we have our platform in place, it's time to move on to the third and final piece that we'll need to create this self-watering tray. Now we have our self-watering mat. This is what provides us the capillary action. This is a synthetic material that is designed specifically to wick water 
I've cut the material to fit my tray and left two inches of overhanging fabric on both the left and right hand side of the tray that we'll get to in a moment. I'll also cover the different matte materials that you can use later in the video. Before we get any further, now would also be a good time to hydrate our mat. Uh, the mat can be kind of hydrophobic at first, especially if you use a synthetic mat. So I would recommend getting a bucket of water and dunking it in that water until the mat is completely hydrated. In order for capillary action to work, the mat needs to make contact with the water. This is where those two extra inches of fabric come into play. I've tucked this edge of the mat into the tray all the way down to the bottom to ensure that the mat is always in contact with water. Now I've tucked both edges into the sides of the tray and we're ready to fill this up with plants. Now that I've got all of my plants situated on the tray, this is when I'd also fill up the tray with water. A tray this size holds about five gallons of water for me and that allows me to go two to three weeks between when I have to fill up the water reservoir, which is certainly a lot less frequent than every couple of days with traditional watering. It's important to note that in order for this whole system to work, the media has to be in contact with the wicking mat, which you can see this net pot accomplishes very well. And I'd just like to mention one of the other huge benefits of using a self-watering system like this. It kind of takes the guesswork out of having to figure out when it's time to water your plants. Since we're relying on the soil physics of capillary action to water our plants, the plants will draw moisture through the substrate as they need it. This means that it doesn't matter whether you have a small plant or a large plant that differ in their water requirements, each plant will receive exactly as much water as they need. There are a number of variables to consider when putting together your own self-watering tray system, particularly the elements that impact water absorption, water retention, and evaporation. I'll cover a few of those that I've experimented with, starting with the wicking material. So here we have two examples of wicking material. On the left side is a synthetic material, and the right side is a natural wool material. The synthetic material here is made out of polypropylene. It has a couple of benefits. Uh, mainly, it wicks very efficiently, and since it's synthetic, it doesn't decay. However, one drawback is that it can be very difficult to rehydrate when the material is completely dry. On the right side, we have a natural wool fiber mat. This mat wicks very efficiently. It also has the benefit of rehydrating very easily. It may decay over time given that it's a natural material. However, I haven't experimented with this particular material long enough to determine that. Additionally, this also may be a dyed product and that dye may sometimes leach into the substrate. Personally, my favorite is the synthetic material mainly because it's wicking efficiency and because of the fact that it doesn't decay. Another factor that you'll want to consider is actually the type of pot that you're using. The type of pot can play a huge role in your self-watering setup's ability to wick water, uh, mainly due to the number of holes on the bottom of your pot that allow the media within your pot to make contact with the wicking mat. And so, I started out using net pots, which are great because they have a ton of holes on the bottom of the pot that allow the substrate to make very sufficient contact with the wicking mat. However, there are also a lot of holes all the way around the sides of the pot. And for certain substrates like cocoa chips, that may cause the substrate to dry out more quickly than the capillary action is able to wick water back into the substrate. Um, so the next uh, type of pot that I've tried out is a fabric pot. So fabric pots are uh, pretty common in the gardening world. However, they're not so common in the world of carnivorous plants or nepenthes. Some growers use them, but not too many as far as I'm aware. Fabric pots are really great at wicking water because they're actually made out of the same exact uh, material that the wicking mat is made out of. So the capillary action is very great at wicking water into the substrate. However, it may work a little too well in some cases. Um, I would probably not use a fabric pot 
for plants that maybe like to be on the drier side just because of how well water is wicked into the substrate. So species like Nepenthes truncata or Rub cantlii or other species that are more sensitive to overwatering probably wouldn't do well in a fabric pot. I've also found that since water is wicked very efficiently into the substrate, the media actually has a tendency to degrade very rapidly, more so um, than it would in another type of pot. The other thing too is uh, fabric pots are incredibly difficult to repot from. So for a lot of reasons, I've chosen not to use fabric pots anymore. The third type of pot you might want to consider is actually a good old fashioned plastic pot um, with a few caveats. So again, you want to ensure that the media is able to make adequate contact with the wicking mat. And to do that, you need to make sure that your plastic pot has drainage holes of relatively large size located on the very bottom of the pot, like these five drainage holes on this pot. Drainage holes that aren't on the very bottom of the pot don't make contact with the mat, and so there is no capillary action that can happen, no wicking, no self-watering action. So the plus side is these pots are super cheap and readily available and pretty common in the industry. So next I want to talk about the type of media that you use. Since we're not actively watering our plants, this is going to be the primary way that you can control moisture. Uh, the first one here is, of course, the classic long fiber sphagnum moss and perlite. It's a classic mix that works well for nearly all plants grown in the self-watering method. Um, sphagnum is incredibly efficient at wicking water. Uh, because of this efficiency, you'll want to be sure to include plenty of perlite, especially for species that are prone to overwatering issues like truncata. Uh, sphagnum, of course, has gotten quite expensive and difficult to find over the last couple years, which is what's led me to the next media. Coconut husk products like cocoa chips and cocoa coir are another popular growing media for Nepenthes. These products won't degrade as quickly as sphagnum does, however, they do need to be washed and rinsed of any salt buildup prior to use with carnivorous plants. An important factor to consider with cocoa products in a self-watering setup is that the porosity of cocoa coir and cocoa chips is actually quite different from the porosity of sphagnum. Porosity is another important topic to discuss when it comes to capillary action. In simple terms, porosity is just the space in between particles in the media. When it comes to capillary action, there is an inverse relationship between soil porosity and capillary action. Lower soil porosity results in more effective capillary action, and inversely, higher soil porosity results in less effective capillary action. There are a lot of factors that affect porosity, but in general, cocoa coir and cocoa chips have more pore space than sphagnum does, even with a good portion of perlite mixed in. So since the porosity of cocoa products is higher than sphagnum, resulting in less effective capillary action, you have to approach using the two medias differently. When it comes to using cocoa products in a self-watering setup, I prefer to use regular plastic pots as opposed to net pots. This is due to the increased airflow of a net pot. I found that the capillary action of cocoa-based media was not high enough to counteract the effects of increased airflow. Luckily, regular plastic pots solved this problem. The last media that I want to cover is Akadama, or really any other mineral-based substrate. Many growers, of course, prefer to use Akadama-based mixes, particularly for highland species. However, like cocoa chips, Akadama is another substrate that does not wick water as efficiently as sphagnum does. So in a self-watering setup, you'll find that you'll have the same difficulties with Akadama that you do with a cocoa-based media. As with cocoa-based substrates, I've found that regular plastic pots are really the only feasible way to use Akadama in a self-watering system that relies on capillary action. There are a number of pros and cons to consider with the self-watering tray system. On one hand, it offers a simpler, less frequent, and more efficient watering routine. 
It also works well with many other plants that have similar watering requirements as Nepenthes, including Heliumphora and Cephalotus to name a few. Due to the simplified watering routine, that equates to more time for other tasks and overall less worry when it comes to being away from your plants for extended periods of time. On the other hand, you do have less control over watering. I would suggest starting with a few easy plants until you get used to this method. I started with a basic Ventrata and then gradually transitioned to more plants as I got more confident using this method. You may also find that the roots begin to grow into the fibers of the mat. To counteract this, I suggest picking up and inspecting your plants regularly and also stay on top of potting up your plants. However, if a few roots get broken off, it's probably not going to be the end of the world. The mats also become hydrophobic when allowed to completely dry out. For this reason, I make sure to check the water levels regularly and fill the trays up before they completely dry out. Lastly, as mentioned, capillary action is less effective with Akadama and cocoa-based substrates. An easy solution for this is to simply use regular plastic pots. To wrap things up, the self-watering tray method for Nepenthes addresses a number of shortcomings associated with conventional watering. However, it's not without its flaws and has plenty of room for improvement and more experimentation. I hope I've inspired some of you to try this method for yourselves. If you do, I hope you find it as beneficial as I have. Once again, happy World Carnivorous Plant Day. The International Carnivorous Plant Society wants you to be successful with your plants. We welcome growers just getting started all the way through professional scientists. We started an annual World Carnivorous Plant Day to celebrate these spectacular plants. Take a look around our website and you'll find historic documents about carnivorous plants, growing guides, free educational resources, and more. Have questions? Ask. We don't bite. But our plants do.